Professor Gautam, are you are you online? I am online. Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome all, all the uh, participants of this uh, special invited talk. Uh, I request Professor T. Ventesh, Director of the Mathematical Sciences Institute, to formally introduce the speaker and uh, then hand over the proceedings to Professor Gautam. Okay. Thank you, Raman. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to have Professor uh, Gautam Barali, uh, the speaker of today's uh, uh, talk. Uh, as you know that uh, the Institute has initiated this year-long theme on geometry, topology, and computer rigs. This was formally inaugurated by Professor Harish Yashadri, a colleague of uh, Professor Barali, but, uh, whom you are going to listen to today. So. Uh, the idea is just to introduce the undergrads, especially those who are uh, passionate about mathematics. You can pick up things, trends that are emerging in this in this area of uh, analysis and connecting to geometry, topology, and other areas. And also, young faculties uh, in the departments of um, uh, Indian universities uh, and then research scholars uh, across uh, uh, India and elsewhere. Well, um, it gives me an immense pleasure to um, introduce um, the speaker of uh, today's uh, lecture, uh, Professor Gautam Brali. Uh, he has a PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, a great school. Uh, and then, um, uh, uh, then he is presently the professor of mathematics at Indian Sub Science Bengaluru. Uh, I have been uh, knowing him, and I uh, and on a couple of occasions I could also listen to his lectures on this theme. So he's a, a renowned uh, um, analyst, and uh, especially in several complex variables, with a strong team at the institute, uh, and they themselves have created a dent. And, and I hope uh, uh, this is going to be a sort of uh, testimony to their uh, standing. Uh, and uh, the, especially uh, the connections to analysis, to geometry uh, under uh, this setting, where uh, today you are going to listen to him on holomorphic uh, maps and the dynamics associated with uh, such uh, functions under several complex variable setting. Indeed, <coughs> it's an opportunity for us to listen to Gautam today. I once again take this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to you, Professor. For having accepted our invitation and to present your uh, talk to the audience. Thank you very much. And over to Professor Gautam. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Venkatesh, for such a kind introduction. Uh, it is actually a great honor. I have been hearing about uh, the Mathematical Sciences Institute for some years now, but I've never had a formal interaction with this institution. So thank you so much. It is it is truly an honor, and uh, it is also very pleasant to me that I'm following in the footsteps of my colleague Harish, kicked off uh, this uh, lecture series. Uh, so with those words, I'm going to first um, share my slides. Uh, Ready when you are. Shall we begin? Yeah. All right. Uh, once again, uh, uh, th thank you once again uh, to uh, Professor Venkatesh for his very generous invitation. Um, so you can see that uh, what I'm going to talk about is the behavior of holomorphic functions in several variables. Uh, since this is a thematic year of lectures where geometry is one of the themes, uh, to people in the audience, I'm actually an analyst by profession. However, this is an area where, where uh, geometry, the area being uh, uh, several complex variables, where geometry plays sort of an inextricable role, even in the resolution of analytical problems. So this, this phrase, the role of dimension, dimension is where geometry is going to enter into today's talk. Right, so let's begin. Um, I. Uh, I have been told about the typical composition of an audience uh, for one of these events. So I am not going to assume that the audience a priori has any background in 
uh, the theory of several complex variables. And in particular, I'm not even going to make the assumption that people know the definition of holomorphicity in several variables. So I will, in fact, begin right at the beginning. And I am going to uh, examine an insight that people are very familiar with. I am assured that everyone in the audience has the background in real analysis to understand the statement that you are just going to see. So I consider an open set in real Euclidean space in D dimensions. Uh, let's call this open set omega. Pick a point A in omega and consider a map omega into Euclidean space of K dimensions. What does it mean for F to be differentiable at the point A? Now, this is something that everybody knows. Uh, we say this is the definition F is differentiable at the point A. If there exists this gadget L sub A, what I have highlighted is simply uh, uh, shorthand for there exists a linear transformation from RD to RK such that the following limit exists, which is I take the norm of the difference of the function evaluated at an increment of a by v minus the value of the function minus this linear transformation acting on v. If I normalize by v, this limit is, is going to exist and be zero. The existence of this limit and the existence of this real linear transformation is our def def definition of classical differentiability. Now, I have a question here. So it's more fun when the talk is interactive. Um, it takes takes a few moments to realize that, that this de definition that I have highlighted for you generalizes the notion of classical differentiability in one real variable. However, if you think about it, another way of generalizing differentiability to higher dimensions would simply be to say that at the point A, so we could say F is differentiable at A if at the point A, uh, each of the principal first order partial derivatives exist. Could make this the definition, but the latter is not the definition. Uh, you will agree that the latter is, in fact, a more, uh, let's say, it's, it's, it's a potential generalization that comes most easily to mind, but that is not the definition of differentiability. So I want to ask the audience, can someone tell me why the latter, why we do not define differentiability as simply the existence of, of all the first order partial derivatives at A. Any volunteers? Would anyone like to volunteer a reason? So please again, again ask the question. So remember um, the notion of a first, part, first order partial derivative is a generalization of the notion of classical differentiability in one variable. So if you have this function f on omega, remember omega being in RD is a function in E real variables. So del del x1 of f at a is simply, if del del x1 of f at a exists, we are saying that the derivative of f restricted to uh, the derivative of x parallel to the x1 axis exists at a. Del, the existence of del del x2 of f says that the derivative of uh, f in a direction that is parallel to the x2 axis also exists at a. So, a very, very direct generalization of the notion of classical differentiability in one variable would simply be to say that del del x1, del del x2, del del x3, dot, 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 del del xd exists at the point. 
But that is not how we define differentiability. Although what I just said definitely specializes, it definitely recovers the classical definition of differentiability. So my question is, can somebody tell me why is this the definition of differentiability? Because you will, it, you will agree that this is a more complicated definition. It is a definition that brings into the picture a linear object. It brings into the picture a matrix, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, can someone offer me an answer? Okay, let me give you the answer because time time is passing, and the answer is. The audience, yeah, tell me. Sir, yes. The first one is the uh, uh, direct generalization of the first definition of the derivative. We can't able to mimic here just because of uh, the division by a vector is not possible. The first thing. And second one is. No, you, uh, no, you have misunderstood my question. That is not the question. The question yes. is, why can I just not say that F is differentiable at A if no. all, all first order partial derivatives exist? Why is that the wrong definition? Because as soon as I say partial derivatives, then that problem that you described disappears. Sir. Yes. There are some things, even though partial derivatives are exist, but uh, the derivative at the point will not exist. OK, that is a much better answer. Uh, now, of course, the answer that you gave is a little bit circular because what we are trying to do is we are trying to discover the definition of a derivative. Uh, but it is almost the answer we are looking for. We are, we are trying to discover the answer, discover the definition of derivative. So. Suppose we propose that the definition of F differentiable at A is to say that all directional derivatives exist at the point A. Then an uh, audience member just said, there are any number of examples of functions. So for those of you who are not aware, I would give this as an exercise to the audience. Write down an example of a function uh, defined in a neighborhood of your favorite point, say the origin in R2, where all partial derivatives, all directional, all partial derivatives in every direction exists. But in fact, the function is not even continuous at that point. Now, remember, whatever be the definition of differentiability, a, the de a definition should be meaningful. So any notion of differentiability, we want this to be a stronger condition of for a function than continuity. And so the answer is that we cannot, the definition that definition for F differentiable at A being that the directional derivative of f at each along each direction exists at a is not adequate because as one of you said you have examples of functions that are not even continuous at a this definition on the other hand, it has two things first of all it is going to it can be it's an easy exercise now to show that this definition specializes to the definition that everybody knows when you have a function in one there. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, it is automatic that a function that satisfies this condition is going to be different, is going to be continuous at A. Now, this is something that I want people to keep in mind, that the definition that, that we just saw, automatically tells us, automatically gives us continuity at A. Okay, now moving on. Uh, this, and this is just a manipulation of symbols. What I wrote up here 
in the case where k is equal to 1. So k equal to 1 means that my f is not a map but is a scalar valued function. In the case of k equal to 1, the above definition is equivalent to the statement that there exists an L sub A, which is this gadget, which is what I have highlighted is just shorthand for saying there is a real linear functional L such that f of x is equal to f of A plus the linear functional L of A acting on the vector x minus A plus little o x minus A. So, to move from symbolics to plain English, real differentiability of a function f at a simply means that little f, f of x admits an excellent r affine approximation close to a, and that affine approximation is just this constant, this number f of a plus this literal. So, the notion of snub this is a talk in on complex variables, so we need to talk about the notion of C differentiability. So if my omega now is an open set, not in real space, but in complex space, if A is a point in omega, F is a function. So now we are looking at a complex valued function. I want you to keep in mind that the last definition, the statement in pure English that I stated, will be our basis of our definition for C differentiability at the point A. OK. Now I want to take a step into the complex universe, and I'm going to give a definition that everyone remembers. This is the definition of from one complex variable which is if I have a set omega, an open set omega in C, okay? If I have a point A in omega, and if I have a complex valued function on omega, I say that F is, different, is, is differentiable at A. So if you look at a textbook in complex analysis, they say F is differentiable at A. If the limit of this difference quotient exists. Now, however, Z is a complex number, but as long as Z is not equal to zero, we can talk about one over Z. We, we leverage the property that C is a field to have this definition. So what a lot of textbooks like the textbook by Conway calls differentiable at A, when f is a function defined on a complex domain, I am going to call c differentiability. Okay, going forward, I'm going to call this c differentiability. Uh, now, this definition, I'm going to label this by star. If you sort of think a little bit philosophically, it has two problems. Number one, star does not generalize if f is now defined on a multi-dimensional domain. If the omega is a domain in Cn and n is greater than 1. And the reason is precisely what someone had articulated when I was talking about real differentiability in the previous slide, which is that if I have a multi-dimensional domain, then you see an increment is a vector quantity and a division by a vector makes no sense. So this difference quotient itself is not going to make sense. The other problem that I have with this definition is it is somehow blind to the knowledge that we all have from complex analysis, as the, 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 the knowledge that we have of classical calculus. Remember, everyone knows in fact, my first slide was just a recap. Everyone knows or should know the definition of real differentiability. So now you see, if I have a function defined on, let's go back to C. If I have a domain sitting in C and my function f is C valued, you see f naturally gives us an R2 valued function. So if I change the target of my function, if I if I say if I view my function not as C valued but as a R2 valued function. So if I change the target of my function, uh, let's let's call that function F sub R. 
So viewing the same f not as a complex valued function, but an R2 valued function. If you remember from the previous slide, so let's go back. This is the definition of any function taking that is vector valued. So if I take R equal K equal to two and apply the definition that you see there, there does not seem to be any resemblance whatsoever with this def between this definition and the notion of real differentiability of the real function f sub r and that in my opinion is a problem you see there is a certain unity in mathematics if i have this definition i would like to be able to see this definition in a way that resembles the definition that we saw in the previous slide. but that is very easily fixed so please note just by inventing some language. So you see, if this limit exists, that is what we call f dash at a. So if I call f dash at a, f dash at a is now a complex number. If I call the c of a, then you see this, this definition star is exactly equivalent to the statement that there exists a complex c of a such that the limit as z approaches zero of the modulus of f evaluated at an increment of a minus f of a minus c of a times z divided by mod of z this limit exists and is equal to zero so the statement that everybody is familiar with can be recast in this little less familiar language, but then what happens is, you see, this now beginnings, begins to resemble what we saw in the previous slide. And this motivates a brief discussion I now want to have. Okay, so I am now ready to give you a way of defining the differentiability of a function defined on a complex domain and taking values in C. So I, I am going to generalize this definition. What I'm going to give you is a generalization of this definition, even though I said that in this format, it doesn't, this format doesn't reveal how this would be generalized to a function defined on a multi-dimensional domain. And my motivation for how to generalize this is to go by this equivalent restatement of the star. So everyone, please keep, uh, please remember the portion that's highlighted because I'm now going to give you a definition. So I now have omega to be open in CN and I'm now not putting any constraints on CN. So this is a multidimensional domain. I fix a point A in omega. And I consider the function f, uh, which maps omega into the complex plane. So I have a c-valued function. So you see, uh, f resolves into its real and imaginary parts, which I'm going to call u plus iv. I say that f is c-differentiable at a if there exists an L sub a so this is exactly the statement that you saw in the first slide. This is simply a short form for saying there exists a linear transformation from R to N to R2, such that the function F sub R is R differentiable. So let's see what F sub R actually is. So remember, F is given as U plus IV. So it also has a double role as a function into R2, which is the function u comma v. Okay, so that's what I mean by f sub r. So I say that f is c differentiable if not only is the function f sub r, r differentiable, but the action of this L sub a, which is a priori a 
real linear transformation from R2 n to R2 has the action of a complex linear function. So this is my definition of C differentiability. So you see what I have done is I take a function f, which is a function in that takes values in C. It has a double role as a function from a domain in R2n into R2. So I say that a function is C differentiable. If, first of all, the function f sub r is classically differentiable, and this matrix acts like a complex linear functional. So this is our definition. So the nice thing is this definition immediately generalizes star. So this is a definition that is reminiscent of the notion of differentiability from your classical calculus. In other words, it is a more, this, this condition has nice linkages with the geometry and the recognition that you want C differentiability is encoded in this line. So the question is, what do I mean by this line? So I'm going to give you for some notation, okay? So um, if I fix a positive integer D, I'm going to denote by superscript to D B standard of R to be the standard ordered basis on R2D in a way that identifies R2D with the D dimensional complex space. How is this identification done? I am how it, its identification is done is if I have a vector in R2D. Well, you know, this is a vector x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 x sub 2n. But I'm going to choose to write a vector in here as x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and so on. So this, this, is, this is that vector. And what this equation is telling me is simply telling me that identification between this and this, mediated by this standard ordered basis. So a vector written this way, you know, it's coordinate with respect to this ordered basis. You know, this would be some matrix, right? It would be some column matrix. What is that column matrix? It is exactly this. So this is simply, I am simply being rigorous. I'm expressing in a somewhat rigorous language the idea that is already clear in, in this line in English. So now here is an exercise for the audience, which is going to clarify what I mean by the action of a real linear transformation as a complex linear functional. So this is the exercise. Consider a real linear transformation from R to N into R2. I want you to this exercise show that the action of this real linear transformation on a vector in, in R2D is that of a C linear functional on this, this same vector given this identification as a complex x, complex n vector, if and only if, if I take this real linear transformation and I write down its matrix representation with this ordered basis on the domain vector space and this ordered basis on the target vector space, what these ordered bases are, I have described upstairs. So if I, so you see, since this is a linear transformation going from R to N to R2, this is going to be a rectangular matrix with two rows, two rows, and two N columns. So let's call the IJF entry, let's say T sub IJ is the IJF entry of this matrix. Then, this is an exercise for you to do. We have these relations. T 
ti comma 2j minus 1 is equal to t2 comma 2j which means what this is saying is if I look at an entry in an odd numbered column on the first row, it will equal the entry in the very next column in the second row. And there'll be a second relation, which is T, I, T sub i comma 2j is equal to the negative of T sub 2 comma 2j minus one, which means if I look at the entry on the first row of an even numbered column, that entry will be the negative of the entry on the second row in the column immediately to the left of it. Okay, that's what these relations are saying in plain English. And since this is a little exercise, it's a fun exercise for the odd. I'm just going to pause for one minute so that those who are interested can note this down. Professor Gautam, yes. am I audible? Yes. So yeah. It would be, uh, be nice if you could also identify yourself because I can't see faces. So may I know your name, sir? Uh, this is Raman Raju uh, speaking. Ah, Raman, uh, go ahead. Yes. yes. Yeah, this is nothing uh, Nothing to do with the lecture. I am sorry. Uh, they, uh, I think the Microsoft Teams is saying that uh, uh, it's five minutes is left for the meeting. So there's some technical issue. If okay. at all it it goes away, then maybe uh, everyone has to log in again to the same ID. Okay. Uh, yeah. So okay. I just wanted to announce it to everyone, including you. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. fair enough. So if yeah. if I get uh, disconnected, I shouldn't panic. I should use the same link, right? Yes. 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 Super. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Good. So. Uh, so people use focus on this thing on the left. Now that this discussion continues, okay, uh, I am deliberately not telling you what the upshot of this discussion is. What I just talked about was simply a way of explaining how how if I say that a real linear transformation acts on a real vector identified as a complex vector, as a C linear functional, then what should I be looking for to, to see that L, L sub A has that property? And the answer is, well, just take them. So this is just the mathematically rigorous way of saying, take the matrix. We all know that any linear transformation has a matrix representation. I'm just saying, take the matrix representation with respect to the basis that I described there. And you are going to get these relations between the matrix coefficients. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I am going to connect so remember we say that f is c differentiable at a if this limit exists and equals zero and simultaneously this happens i have just given a fun calculation for people to do to understand when i know that this happens so now what is this telling us and this is simply telling us that the function u comma v function mapping into R2 given by U comma V is classically differentiable. So remember from calculus that if a func if my function F sub R, which is the function U comma V, is differentiable in the sense of classical calculus, then you see the Jacobian, so, so L sub A in terms of this basis is nothing but the Jacobian matrix, not the Jacobian determinant, the Jacobian matrix. So how is that? I first pick up my first component of the function F sub R, which I just said is U. So the first row just has U, 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 U everywhere. But with respect to the basis that I described in the previous slide, the first row is, first I have del del X1 of U at A, 
then I have del del y1 of u at a. Dot 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 dot. The last two columns are going to have del del x sub n of u at a and del del I'll finally del del y sub n of u. The second row will have the same sequence of partial derivatives, but now applied to the second component. This is something, so this is familiar to everybody. This is the Jacobian matrix. So just from your real differential, so what have we achieved? If this L sub A has to act like a C linear functional, so combining this line with this, we get the following relations. So remember, I had described to you how to interpret this line in plain English. What I'm saying is if I, if I pick, pick a matrix entry in an odd numbered column, let's say the first column, that matrix entry should be the entry in the column immediately following it, but on the second row. So I get del del x j of u is equal to del del y j of v. And I also get del del y j of u. So if I look at any, any even numbered column, then the entry in an even numbered column in the first row will equal the entry in the column immediately to the next of it, but with a negative sign. So I have del del y j of u is equal to minus del del x j of as j runs from 1 to n. Now, if, if I had a function in just one complex variable, meaning n was equal to 1, so I do not have two n equations, I have just n equations, I want to say that these are equations that you recognize. So I will not have del del x j of u is del del y j of v, I'll simply have del del x of u is equal to del del y. And I will have del del y of u is equal to the negative of del del x of v. I claim this is very, very familiar. What is this that you are at? Sir, is this a cauchy riemann equation? Absolutely. These are the cauchy riemann equations. So you see, I gave you a definition of C differentiability. So when you try to look at the definition of C differentiability and you express the linear transformation that the definition whose existence is given to you by the definition of C differentiability, you get a bunch of relations. So we have just proved that if f is c differentiable at all points in its domain, then f actually satisfies the cauchy riemann conditions. Thing is, because f is now defined on a multi-dimensional domain, instead of two cauchy riemann conditions, there will be two n conditions. So you see, c differentiability implies a system of Cauchy Riemann conditions. So now this is beginning to link the geometrical definition of differentiability, which we have in real calculus, with the definition of differentiability in complex analysis that you study from a book like Conway's. And when you combine them, you see the CR Cauchy Riemann conditions at the core. However, when you think about complex analysis in one variable, you say, well, you know, there's another definition that is often given, which is that you say that a function is complex analytic or a function is holomorphic if there is a power series development around each point. So the question that will arise is, well, what about a power series development? Okay, so another discussion. So again, I am now going to have the same setup as I have been discussing. And I have this extremely elementary function. If I take a point in my multidimensional domain, z1 dot 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 zn, mapping to zk for some fixed k, then you see for this 
if I view this f as a real function, then my u is just xk and my v is just yk. And so trivially condition one is satisfied, clearly. Trivially one is satisfied. Okay. So, so in other words, I have just shown that, that, that this function is a C differentiable function. Now remember the proof of the product rule is a purely formal limitation, provided of course all of the relevant limits exist. So you see by the point that I just made, if I now take any multi-index alpha one dot 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 alpha n, and I define this monomial z to the power alpha, this is just my shorthand for this thing that I've just, just described. So this is just a product of various z sub k's because this is a product, because we have established that z sub k is C differentiable, uh, or another way of looking at it is it satisfies condition one, so does this product. So now I'm going to appeal to certain manipulations which are a part of classical analysis. So we now move away a little bit from analysis, from calculus to analysis to convergence and so on. So you see, since the derivatives in, in, in that occur in condition one are real derivatives, the proof that you all know of term by term differentiation of series and this observation that I have actually tells me that if for each A in omega, I can find a polydisc that sits inside omega and has center A. So what do I mean by a polydisc? What I mean by a polydisc centered at A is if I write this A as A1, A2, dot, 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 AN, and if I look at any disk, standard disk with center AJ and radius RJ, a polydisc is simply a Cartesian product of such disks. So, if for each A in omega, there is an open centered at A, so that if I restrict F to delta, then, then, and F has this power series development, what do I mean by a power series development? which means that the right-hand side is absolutely convergent. And this is why I said that this conclusion, then F satisfies one. Why this is a statement in analysis is because, because I have to, I want to be able to apply the derivatives term by term. And the statement that the RH has being absolutely convergent allows me to do so. This is a statement in sequences and series. So I have a sequences and series. And I am able to apply, apply uh, uh, um, these partial derivatives, real partial derivatives term by term. So F satisfies me. But remember, one, the condition one is actually a necessary and sufficient condition for C differentiability. So actually, if F has this property, then in fact, I am actually saying F is C differentiable. So this discussion step one, step two, step three constitutes 50% of the of the theorem that first theorem meet, which is if I have an open set that is multi-dimensional open set, and I have a function on this open set that takes complex values, 
the following are equivalent. Number one, F is differentiable at each point Z in omega. Part B, the function F, you, the function F, which I'm going to write, decompose in its real and imaginary parts as U plus. This function is continuous. So remember the statement I had made in the first 15 minutes of this talk. Because our differentiability at a point implies that my function is continuous at that point, that's almost automatic. So likewise, if f is c differentiable at an arbitrary point, that that function is continuous at every point. Uh, so b implies that f admits all first uh, or first order partial derivatives at each z in omega and satisfies relations. So this implication A implies B and conversely, we, we just actually proved this discussion, part one, part two, part three, but A is equivalent to B is also equivalent to C, which is F has the property that for each little A in omega, there is an poly disk. I can find an open disk delta such that F restricted to delta has a this statement, I gave one implication, which is if I assume C, then I have that F is C differentiable, but the converse is also true. So to recapitulate, these three properties for the function F, property A, property B, and property C are equivalent properties. And each of the above is a def definition of F being polymorph. So in the next, uh, so basically I have about 20 minutes remaining. Um, if I, going forward, if I say F is holomorphic at omega, I mean, I will assume any one of these properties, these are equivalent. Each of these is the, is is the definition of holomorphicity. Also, a little bit of notation. The set of all holomorphic functions in omega, I'm going to denote that set as O of omega. By the way, I hope you were, you were observing that the class of holomorphic functions is not vacuous, right? Because in the discussion I had in the, dis in the, the last triad of points, point one, point two, and point three, we saw that all functions of the form Z going to ZK, that is to say, Z mapping to its Kth coordinate is a holomorphic function. Monomials in the variables Z1, Z2, Z3, dot, 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 Zn are holomorphic functions. Power series that are convergent in this sense are holomorphic functions. So there are lots of holomorphic functions. However, this is where things become interesting, and this is where geometry is going to enter the picture. So, so whatever I have just said, I have spent a fair amount of time not only defining what it means for function in n variables to be holomorphic, but motivating the definition, and at the same time saying that I can view a function that's holomorphic in three different and equivalent ways, whatever way is convenient. But then you see, all that is saying is that if I have a function in n variables when n is greater than or equal to two, the local behavior of a holomorphic function in n variables is exactly analogous to the behavior of a one variable function. Nothing new. But if I now consider a multidimensional domain omega and I view a holomorphic function globally, holomorphic functions in two or more variables have extremely different behavior. So complex analysis in one variable is a whole different subject from two or more variables. Uh, a, some, some fraction of this audience, I am sure, must have heard of this result. It's a famous result by Poincaré, 
which is that the polydisc DM. So I have defined for you what the disc is, right? A polydisc is an n-fold Cartesian product of a bunch of discs. So if I take the standard open unit disc and take the n-fold product thereof, so this is something that sits inside CN. The polydisc is not biholomorphic to the Euclidean unit n as soon as n is greater than or equal to. So you see this shows that the Riemann mapping theorem everybody is familiar with fails spectacularly in higher dimensions. Why did I bring the Riemann mapping theorem into the picture? You see, um, this DM and this BM are both simply connected. Moreover, they are in fact homeomorphically. So you see, if you had a simply connected domain in C, that is not all of the complex plane, all of the then it is biholomorphic to the unit. That's the Riemann. Not true, spectacularly, or true when n is greater than or equal to. And the question now arises: Well, uh, why is that so? Now, this is a theorem I'm not going to prove. It is a theorem that a lot of people know, but it involves a lot of moving. This theorem will require time. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to examine two other results which are, let's say, a little more foundational uh, that actually show that there is an enormous divergence between complex analysis and one variable and complex analysis and several variables. Namely, rather than this, I'm going to present to you two results that are results in two or more variables that do not have a one variable answer. And uh, geometry is going to actually enter up, is going to be an important consideration in our proofs. So at this point, before I move to unfamiliar theorem, really briefly, uh, uh, does anyone have a question that I can, I can handle in one? Any questions on the material covered so far? Okay, it means I guess this suggests I can move. I, I did hear someone unmuting themselves. Question. Let's carry on. So here is a theorem. This has not only does this have no analog in one variable, what I am saying is false in one variable. So let D be a domain in CN, but now N is greater than or equal to two. Let F be a holomorphic functional D, then the zero set of F does not contain any isolated points. This is totally false in one variable, right? In fact, a function in one variable is either going to be a constant function, a function that is a function defined on a domain, meaning to say on a connected open set, is either going to be identically zero or its zero set is going to be discrete. So you see how different things. So let me give you a sketch of the proof. So first of all, if my function f were identically zero or if the zero set were empty, then of course there is nothing to. In the first case, every point in a domain is non-isolated. And if I have the second case, then my theorem is vacuously true. So I am going to assume that the zero set of F, which I'm going to call Z, is neither empty, nor is it all of them. So here is a picture. Okay. I am going to prove this by contradiction. So assume that cap the zero set, capital Z, contains an isolated point A. So this is what this picture is depicting. Of course, this is a very schematic diagram because when I am in C2, then my domain is something in four dimensions. This is something that's easy to draw, but consider this as a schematic. So I'm assuming something and I'm going to get to a contradiction. So, um, so you see, because I'm assuming that this A is an isolated point, I can find a, 
a positive number little r such that this poly disk delta this is the cartesian product of a bunch of disks centered at a1 a2 a3 dot 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 a n you see by definition of an isolated point if i choose r to be small enough this open set delta is not going to intersect Z at any other point but the point A, which is what you now see. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a bunch of functions, phi sub nu. These are going to be now, these are going to be classical functions in one bear. Okay, so familiar territory. I'm going to define functions phi sub nu, nu equal to one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera, which are functions that will be holomorphic in this, this little planar disk, and they're going to be defined the following. Phi sub nu in one complex variable is the function where I eval, what I basically do is I fix the last n minus one coordinates at a3, a4, dot, 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 a n. And I, what I do is I evaluate f at a point where the first coordinate is a1 plus zeta, and the second coordinate is the point a2 minus r upon. So let's, so let's look at this n-tuple over here. This n-tuple basically describes a slice in n dimensions whose schematic is this little disk that you see and you see because of this by construction because you see because i am i am when i evaluate f sub nu my second coordinate is never ever ever for any value of nu to be a2 i'm never going to touch the zero set and so phi sub nu is going to be non-vanishing for every nu which is the schematic of this, you can see in this picture. So now people can check that phi sub nu converges. So also, so the reason why I have this a1 plus zeta is so that I could view this as a function in a domain centered at the origin. That is why I had this shift here. So everyone, please check that the, my sequence of functions phi nu given very explicitly by this formula, converges uniformly on compact subsets of this planar disk. This is a standard disk in one dimension. So by Hurwitz theorem, you see the limit function must be zero free on this disk because all of these piece of news are zero. But that is a contradiction because you see, if you look at if you look at this limit function, if you look at this limit function, evaluated at zeta equal to zero, it is nothing but f evaluated a one, a two, a three dot 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 a n. In other words, it's f evaluated at this point, which is zero. That's a contradiction. Now, do you see that no element of this proof can be carried out to yield a contradiction if I'm in only one You see, what makes this proof work is that I'm able to prove, play with at least two core. I can, I can fix my evaluation of F at a point in my first coordinate that's depicted this way and the second quarter is depicted this way. I, I need both of these protagonists, otherwise it doesn't work. So this is what I meant by the role of function. I need a minimum of two dimensions for this. But I hope people are now appreciating that complex analysis in one variable is, is a whole different animal from the field to which a result like this belongs, which is the field of analysis in several variables. Okay, so I'm now going to actually uh, mention another phenomenon which has no analog 
some variable, which is, so again, I'll have to have my dimension to be at least two. So in, multi, in multi-dimensional Euclidean space, I want to state there exist domains. So these have to be proper subdomains, okay? There exist lots of proper subdomains that have the property that they admit a strictly larger domain, call it omega sub d, strictly larger than d, such that any and every function that is holomorphic to d extends to a holomorphic function on this strictly larger domain. Now, why something like this is potentially possible in two or more dimensions, while it's totally impossible when n is equal to 1, is heuristically explained by the last theorem. So, you see, suppose a pair like this, pair with the property over here, existed for some planar domain. Then, you see, this is a strictly larger domain, so is larger and is connected. There's a little typo here, okay? I meant this to be D. Then you see there would ex have to exist a point which lies in the interior of a and at the same time on the boundary of D. E. Ah, so now consider this function. This is totally holomorphic in D because you see the point where there is a pole does not lie in D. But because there is a pole at P, this function, which I'm calling F sub P, can't extend even continuously to the larger domain, which I have hypothesized exists. Well, that gives me a contradiction. So a property like this will be absolutely impossible in one. Way. Now, when N is greater than or equal to, you see, this argument can potentially fail it'll fail on any domain, any, so now a multi-dimensional domain that admits a point P in the boundary, such that if I have any function that's holomorphic on some neighborhood of, we have that the zero set of F intersecting D union P is, okay? So this is in principle possible because the previous result tells us that the behavior of zero sets of holomorphic functions in higher dimensions in, in no way, shape, or form resembles uh, the one variable case. So in principle, this is possible. And if this happens, I can't now look at the function one over z and say, look, uh, I have a contradiction. So this this trick will fail, but this is all somewhat somehow philosophy. We will now see that such things are not just in principle statements. These are not just philosophical statements. Uh, pairs having this property exist in abundance, and I want to show you a So, Professor Venkatesh, at this point, I have actually exhausted my one hour. But uh, could I maybe take another five minutes? Okay, Professor, you can, you can. Yeah. So I'm, I'm basically on, I'm, thank you very much. I'm basically on my last yeah. slide. So I want to state this theorem by Hartox. So I don't want to leave the lecture at a note which is philosophical. Uh, I want to actually give an example of a, up domain pair d comma omega sub d. So let's consider this. Uh, so I pick two positive numbers r and s. You are supposed to understand these to be not just smaller than one, but very, very small number. And I define this domain d. Now again, this definition requires me, requires my dimension to be at least two. Now, it's actually easier to understand what this domain D is by a picture, and you will say, look, Dota Mari crazy, this is a domain in Cn. For even for n equal to 2, I need to imagine something in 
happening in four dimensional space. But uh, what I want to point out is if you look at the definition of D, its definition is given not by some condition on Z1, Z2, Z3, dot, 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 n, but on mod Z1, mod Z2, mod Z3, et cetera, et cetera. So if I, if I look at a simple case where n is equal to 2, in which case I'm going to, let's call our Z1 to be Z, and let's call our Z to be W, this domain is actually given by conditions on modulus of Z and modulus. So let's, def let's draw the modulus Z modulus W. And in this plane, the description of the set is given by this region shaded in line. So I claim that this is a region that has this seriously unexpected property mentioned in slide number. So how, do, how does the proof go? So actually, I'm just going to write at the very outset define for each little f, remember for each little f, I am claiming that there is a function in, in omega d such that little f sub f restricted to d is equal to f. So what is this omega d? We will discover this right now. So if Z is in little d, it's just going to be little f of z. If Z satisfies these conditions, then I'm going to define little, I'm going to define capital F the best by this expression. So if you stare at this picture, basically I am for every Z that sort of sits in this in this region that I have just drawn, I get a definition. In other words, my omega sub D in this case is the unit. My omega sub D in this case is going to Now, you see, there are two separate definitions for F sub F on an overlapping region. If you look at E as I have defined it, if you look at the region defined, uh, they overlap. And in our schematic, they overlap in this region described shaded in blue. Now, all I have to do is I, I, I'm going to give you a rigorous uh, reason why I only need to show that this definition and this definition coincide on the O. And I will have shown that if omega sub D is the unit polydisc, then, then this function is a holomorphic function. Uh, note that this, this part of the theorem is already encoded definition. Now, why is it so? Why is it that I just have to establish well defined of this? And the reason is, you see, this is already a holomorphic function by hypothesis. Now, over here, I can differentiate under the integral sign. And so, uh, what will happen is, so if I apply the derivatives del del xj and del del yj, because this is a holomorphic function, you will find that this, of course, satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations because this is by hypothesis holomorphic, but this too is going to satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations at each point where this is defined. And let me now give you what is. What is this, this is just given by this expression here. So, so you see, as soon as I establish well-definedness, I will have shown that uh, F sub F is holomorphic on the unit polydisc, which, which is given by the union of this shaded region that I have just indicated together with his, what is already given to you. Okay, so now let us look at 
slices, one-dimensional slices, which are schematically indicated by this violet. Specifically, so these are slices, okay? So these are things sitting in multidimensional space. So you see, if you look at this violet line, it is advanced. So mod Z is growing, 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 growing. It is growing all the way to this line, which is one minus R2. So if you're wondering, like, how can I even So you see this integral is defined where zeta varies over the circle of radius one minus R2. So schematically, if I fix Z2 to Zn, then for each fix Z2 to Zn, schematically, that's this red line here, which is clearly sitting inside of the domain definition of F. And so that is why the definition of this, there is no problem. The problem is these two may conflict on the blue region. Okay, so now, so you see, more, as I follow this violet line, mod Z is growing, 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 going all the way up to one minus R of two. So that is, so in the first coordinate, I have this, this disk. And there's a typo over here. I should have said Cartesian product, this point, where this point is, a, is fixed, and it's fixed such that Z sub J is less than S. So then you see on such a slice, the two definitions coincide. And why is that so? You see, because if I treat Z2 as, as a fixed parameter, so this, this dot over here is I'm writing this in a functional notation. You see, if I fix Z2 through Zn such that they satisfy the then you see that the relevant disk sits inside of the region where we mean f is holomorphic. So this, this slice function is a holomorphic function. And so this is simply the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the Cauchy integral form. Right, so that's simple and then. So there we, therefore we conclude that f sub f on O given by this formula coincides with my original F on O and O is that 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 blue region I talked to. It, it, well no O is this region which is a subset of the blue region but it is an open subset. Now at this point I want to invoke the fact that if a function which is holomorphic, holomorphic on, so remember this, this F sub F given by this formula, I have said by this argument is holomorphic on this blue region. So is this little f, obviously, because this blue region sits inside the D that was you. Now, remember in complex analysis in one variable, if you have two functions that are holomorphic on some connected open set, and they coincide on a set containing a limit, two functions coincide. Now, unfortunately, that result is not true, right? I discussed this today. That result is not true when n is greater than or equal to two. That is because zero sets will have limit points. However, a version of that theorem holds true, which is that if you have two functions on a connected open set, multidimensional, holomorphic, and they coincide on a non-empty open set, then the same conclusion. So you need a much stronger condition but under that condition, the two functions are going to coincide. That's called the identity theorem. So because this on this O, these two things coincide, 
because this blue region is connected and because O is an open subset of this blue region, this definition and this definition are going to coincide. And as I told you, that is all that I needed to prove, right? Because as I had said, my earlier remark was holomorphicity is a local property. So you see, once the conflict is resolved, I have already said that at each point, whether you look at this definition or you look at this definition, in the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied. So locally, we have holomorphicity, but because holomorphicity is a local property, we are done, and hence the proof. And that's all I have time for today. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you will have seen that here too. Um, this, this sort of a manipulation of taking a slice, we, we can't even, a, a slice doesn't even make sense if we are in one. So we need at least two dimensions for this whole thing to even make sense. So with those words, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, um, thank you, Gautam Brali. Uh, uh, I allow a couple of questions quickly. Sure, sure. Uh, no I hope uh, you would entertain them, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. So, any questions from the audience, please? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Asar, please suggest a book uh, in several complex variables so that we can go in deep uh, from the basics. Yes. yes. Okay, that is a very good question. Uh, since I don't have an access to the chat box, uh, first let me give you the name of the authors, okay? So I would say that the book that uh, has a very good treatment of material like this from the beginning, like right from the definition and in fact incorporating some of what I have talked about, which is we motivate things beginning from the definition. Uh, this is a book by, let me first begin with the author's names. Uh, the authors are Fritsche and Grauert. So let yeah. me spell out the two names, okay? So do you have something to write on? Yeah. Okay. Fritsche is F R I D T as in Tamil Nadu, Z S C H E. That's Fritsche. Grauert is G R A U E R T. Grauert is a very well known German mathematician. So this is a book by Fritsche Grauert. And yeah. uh, I actually. Uh, from holomorphic functions to complex manifolds. Uh, I have kept my camera on. So is a thumbnail of me visible? Because if so, then I can hold this book up. Uh, so this is a Springer book. So it's a book by Shea and Broward. And it is called From Holomorphic Functions to Complex Manifold. It's a very comprehensive book. It starts from very elementary material. And as the title suggests, it goes all the way into analytic geometry. It goes into, into analytic Professor, you can you can hold the book once again. Uh, a participant can pin pin the uh, speaker and you can see the picture. Yeah, anybody who wants to see the book can pin the speaker and you can see the book. It's from holomorphic functions to complex manifolds by Frisch and Gravert. Yeah, right. Yes. I, uh, Dr. Chidanan Badige, a member of Mathematical Sciences in Shibagami. I take this opportunity to ex express our gratitude towards Professor Gautam Barai. As we uh, now, we have successfully completed a program under the theme of Geometry, Topology, Combinatorics, which is the year-long year theme of our institute. 
under under which we have uh, conducted an invited talk by professor gautam barali on titled behavior of holomorphic functions in several variable so on behalf of our institute and all team of the msib i extend i uh, thank professor gautam barali sir thank you and i extend the extend it for our director professor t venkatesh sir thank you sir and also i thank all organizing team of ms uh, msib and also i extend it for all the participants who have participated in this program i i, I thank heartily and also on the behalf of our institute thank you thank you one and all thank you very much thank you sir right so professor venkatesh it was uh, to speak to right now so